the climate. Uh, probably like you know, 20 years ago, it was very conducive for squats and community gardens. Has the highest concentration of community gardens anywhere in the United States, 38 and 39 right now in the Lower East Side. So it's a very good climate where people took over public space that was the city space, but the city had a lot of space back then, 35 years ago, because it was broke. It was much like Detroit right now. So the city cut back on social services, the police, the schools, the garbage pickup. They cut back very heavily in the Lower East Side or Lower East Side of the city, and they cut back in the South Bronx. The people on the Lower East Side took back the neighborhood themselves. They didn't want to wait for the city. They took back the spaces, the buildings, the gardens. And in that process, you had a real different way of thinking, of skill share, where people taught each other stuff. Uh, they had to have to fix up buildings. I was a plumber, so I had to help fix up. There was people who were electricians, and it was a way of taking back the neighborhood, but then also using different skills. A very community structure. From that community structure, a lot of stuff started I only, that's my specialty, the Lower East Side, uh, or the Lower East Side area, but a lot of amazing things started. That's how New York City got recycling, for instance, because in the community gardens, they started doing things, they figured, oh, let's recycle. That's how New York City's gonna get composting now, because there was these little gardens are like scientific experiments, and then the city picks up on it. That's how New York City got bicycling, kind of strange, right, bicycling. Everybody was bicycling in the Lower East Side for transportation 20 years ago, before the rest of the city, which was very dangerous, the people from the Lower East Side organized group bike rides to come into the rest of the city, mostly organized by squatters, because I also started this environmental organization called Time's Up, and we had a big deal to do with get biking. So we used the squats to organize that, we used the squats to organize the gardens. So the squats aren't just squats, they're also a place where people can organize. Um, let me see if they're coming as the police. Then after three months is the next one, it's 10 years, it's called adverse possession, and that means you get the building and stuff like that. What happens after three months? You, you technically, I'm trying to call one of those speakers. Like the police? Yeah, the police. But not right. No. You pay to, you to like a co-op? Or you yes, pay to it's co-op, co yeah, co-op. You don't pay to the legal law. No. So the squats that are kind of represented in the museum and the, the famous ones, so called, are like ABC to Rio. How many people heard of that? Yeah. So that's a squat. It started off as a squat in uh, Europe and stuff. The squats sometimes are called social centers, and it's a really good way to open up a building. You just don't open it up to live there. You go to it, you find an abandoned building, no one's using it. You have a meeting with people in the community, and you all get together, like, what does this community need? They seem to need something for school, and we need to save this garden. And you start using the first floor of the building to organize something for the community. That's a social center. And then later on, you start taking over the rest of the floors and possibly live there. That doesn't so much happen in America. Yeah. No, but just clarification. I still think, let me just, my personal opinion. Uh, there's a difference in Europe between social center and, and squat, right? So social center is a form of legalized squat, while squatting is illegal when people don't pay utilities, don't pay rent, and they just occupy a building and stay there like for free, they don't, don't pay for nothing. Uh, and, and when uh, they legalize somehow, you know, like manage with the court or like owner, it could become as a social center, as you said, right? So there's a different social center squat. Because squat is like illegal, right? Well, social center starts up illegal sometimes. Yeah. But there's also food places, you have to break into it uh, sometimes, and then you have to organize some people to do this. You have to kind of try to get your research, and it's a little bit better to break in one that's owned by the city. That's, you know, an American thing. I'm not so good at how it goes. There are other cities like in Amsterdam where you could just pull up a boat and squat or take over an old factory in Berlin. Sometimes the, the city will actually, you can go to them and talk to about it. So different places around the world different situations. There's a situation where you can do something for the community and occupy the building illegally, or you can live there, which I do, right? I live in a spot. And then as time goes on, sometimes your building will get legal or you'll have to move out, you know? And sometimes you'll fight in the process. So uh, Frank Zine that we're kind of trying to talk about, so hopefully he's coming, but it covers about how to do this in New York City. Um, and then so, I usually come in on the second half and show you once you get in the building, like what to look for. So I'm gonna start that first. 
But when you get in these buildings, don't forget, most of the time there's no electricity, there's no heat, like the windows even open. Um, there's a lot of technical stuff just to get it feasible to live there. Now years ago it was much worse. Now sometimes you could get it up, right? You need electricity, you need water, and you need to deal with your waste. Because years ago in the city didn't have waste, people didn't live too long, right? They had outhouses and then they got plumbing. So it was all this technical stuff. So I'm gonna start the second half first, so flip around in your mind. Anybody still unclear what a squat is? <laughs> yes, cool clarification question. So you live in this building, so and basically you live legally, and no, no one can just kick you out, right? Yes, any squat could be kicked out. Any community garden in the Lower East Side. How many people have been in a community garden? Right now, there's a there's a plaque on it, and it says Green Thumb is helping out this garden. Right? Miller. That's all junk because Mayor Giuliani, if you guys remember, said clearly on the news over 40 times he would like to destroy every community garden. The people took over those places, it's the same thing, but now the city says they're okay with them. But that could change any day. You know, the squats could, it's the climate of the city you're in. A lot of cities are getting together now and stopping squatting, just like they did with Occupy Wall Street. But did they have problems with police and policy? How do you solve problems, you know, in your situation? Each city is different how they, big city called an eviction watch list. Oh, but this place. Yeah, we have an eviction watch list, yeah. and we call people if there's a problem, and people show up, and that's how we say go to squats in the gardens. It was, a, it was at a place called 50 Avenue B, uh, uh, which was Blackout Books. It was an anarchist bookstore that held this. It was before cell phones. There was also a pirate radio station in 7th Street Squat. So, so can I turn up the lights? Yeah. Okay, cool. Because I started this environment, it turns up. So people call me that. Uh, this is the building I live in. Can't really see it, but a, I took pictures of this stuff at the museum. It kind of shows you right here how to open up the squad. If it has this X, that means the building was abandoned. Um, and then people just broke into the building. And then the building I live in is called Umbrella House. It's on Avenue C between 2nd and 3rd. I didn't open it up, but I've lived there probably for over 15 years, I guess. Mm -hmm. Not even sure. Um, it doesn't look like this now, it's a lot nicer. Are there a lot of other people, other people in the same building? Yeah, the guy who start, uh, Steve Englander, he's the director of ABC in Rio. He lives above me and uh -huh. started this group. So a lot of activists live in this one. Bullet Space, kind of one of the more famous art squats uh, in New York City. And they still have their first floor open. You can go there on the weekends and it's like a gallery. Uh, the reason it's called Bullet Space because they were selling a lot of drugs in the area, and the heroin was called Bullet. Uh, anybody heard of this building before, Bullet Space? No. Okay, ABC in Rio, one of the most famous spots in New York City. No one lives in this building. It's a, 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 a place where volunteers, there's very few places that volunteer run, they're pretty much all on this map here if you want to get one. And a lot of the spots, the gardens, these places are collectively decision making, just like Occupy Wall Street and also run by volunteers. So this place has a computer lab on the top floor. They have old school photography classes. They have a zine library. Uh, they have Food Not Bombs used to run out of there. Um, they have a screen printing shop if people want to make t-shirts. They have the, you guys have been to the underage punk shows or whatever, or something, someone say they got to punk shows. How many people have been in this building? No? Yeah. Okay, cool. What else did I miss? What else do they have there? Um, dark rooms. Dark rooms. Oh, what else? And the gallery, and then time's up, kind of as Mike repair the basement. Uh, 297 Street, that picture. This is where that pirate radio station was, right here. I was a DJ on it, and then when we didn't have cell phones, we didn't have computers, and how did you get information about like when they were gonna come destroy the squads or the gardens? We had our own radio station, it was called Steal This Radio. It's on 7th Street. Anybody know the artist Fly? Kind of a, yes, so Fly lives here, you know Fly? Okay. What's anything about Fly? I don't know that much about her. My roommate loves <laughs> Yeah. She makes a lot of zines and a lot of stuff like that. Also, these like zine culture were big with the squatters, a way to spread information backwards. Uh, Frank, who's supposed to be here, hopefully he'll walk in. This is where he lives. And this squat did actually get under the other thing that the other squats get with this UHAP deal. So the city didn't want to do with the squatters. It's a longer story, but they transferred them to another group. Then the other group said, if you guys get legal, you can actually get your building. But he actually lives in a squat that's still a squat. This is a squat uh, called C Squat, kind of like the more rugged squat where you can like, knock on the front door. So you know, hey man, I really just got off the train. Can I like sleep on the floor? And they like they might let you sleep there. 
So it's actually a real squat. Some of the other squats have kind of got past that now where they don't really let people traveling to stay there. It's a music squat, um, leftover crack. Oh God, there's like so many bands I could name. Anybody see any bands in C-Spot? It has a, yeah, leftover crack lives there. You saw, and you saw some bands there too, yesterday, right? Was it yesterday? Uh, two days ago. Yes, yeah, so he came to the museum for the left forum and I was like, oh, if you stick around, there's some bands. And there were like all these bands from England. It was just really low key. How much did it cost? Like almost nothing. Yeah, it was like suggested that I, yeah, it was like five bucks. Yeah, it's insane. We were, like, how many bands for five bucks? Yeah. It's like six, right, or something. Yeah, it was like, you know, it's that kind of thing. Uh, in front of this building, to get legal, they needed to do some stuff. And they wanted, they came to me, because I do a lot of stuff with gardens and a lot of stuff in these hills. They're like, can you do something with the first floor? We don't want a Starbucks. It's about two years ago, and I was like, nah, it's too far for bike repair, for the bridges too. But then I thought, wow, what a cool place to open up a museum. So I opened up a museum there. It's about squatting, it's about gardens, it's about activism. It kind of tells a little bit of the truth and stuff, and there's like pictures and videos. We're also collecting people's pictures and videos, so we're archiving and trying to tell a different side of the story. It's been very difficult because, you know, as you said, squatters are not very, very scared of their history because they got such a bad reputation. The community gardeners were like that a year ago, but now they're all like, if you go to the lower side, they all are so proud of their history now and there's tours going on and that kind of thing. So hopefully that'll happen in the future about squats. These are just some of the buildings. Go ahead. Um, but most of these seem pretty older, but squats were established. Have uh, people tried to go through the I think so. That takes ten years, right? So, yeah. like, do you think like they they now really own these buildings, or they're still totally? I think that um, all these things—it's never one thing or another thing. When you work on these things, it's always like pieces of things. The idea that people like there's this guy in my building, and I'm like, oh my god, the cops are outside. And he tells me like, well, they have to kill me to get the building. And he was serious. And I was like, well, that's a pretty serious statement, you know. But the idea is like that energy of what he was saying and the energy, the law energy, and all these little pieces really help. So it's never one thing, that, you know, but it's, it's, it's if the politicians don't like you, if they do like you, if you have community pressure. So that law is a law in New York City, it says 10 years. And I think it helped because a lot of the spots in New York City went past 10 years, although it wasn't the only factor, but it did kind of give a lot of weight. Um, but you know, I know this is crazy, but just doing a little bit of history, when this thing happened, when the city went bankrupt like 35 years ago, there were so many buildings. Because even if you own a building, like you own that building across the street, and you stop paying your taxes, the city gets that building. About, about eight of 10 buildings in the Lower East Side then reverted back to the city. That's why they had, there was, so the city was like giving them away for a dollar. So to say the squatters had a good deal is a joke because a lot of people bought the buildings for that. The squatters wanted a different way of life where they would do stuff for the community, a different voting process, and they had work days. So they built the buildings themselves. So it's not really about money sometimes, it's more about like community. So I, my question is just about the legal title. So like, were they, like after 10 years for most of these buildings, were they sort of, was the title transferred to the squatters? It wasn't that, it was, the law says that, but it doesn't just happen. Okay. Um, no, so they, were they were transferred to a group called You Have, yeah. Urban something. Urban, urban Homestead. Oh. Right. And then they said, the city said, <laughs> the city said, you guys deal with these squatters, we can't deal with them anymore. And then we've been working with them to get up to code. That means we have to get real heat, we have to get real doors and all that kind of stuff. Once you get up to code, then maybe you'll get your building back. Would you say that there's a general attitude of everyone who lives there? You know, um, I understand that everyone's pretty much like unique in certain ways, but to live together in a squat, you know, there's a certain mindset. You know, there's a culture there. Um, you know, like, could you could you share a little bit about you know what the general attitude is? You know, about property. You know, and you know why is it okay to live in a place like that? You know, there's an exchange. Well, I don't country. really like cursing. But I, don't do it I mean, fuck the system. Yeah, would be a good one for some people. Other people might be like, you know, I really need a place to live, and I don't. Get along and they don't have much money. Yeah. And other people would be more leaning towards like, this is a place I want to be a serious activist and I can live it. You know what I mean? So I didn't really move in the squat I did for the, that, any of those reasons. I did because I'll give you a question in a second. Um, what's your name? Okay. 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 And you, where do you live?
and Mayor Giuliani is going to auction them all off. So we have to really go into overdrive to do this. And I originally thought, going to all these demonstrations, like, oh my god, there's so many squatters, you know? But then I found out there's not that many, that they just really care about stuff. So, so that's why I moved in, because that they meant something to me, and they also said that I can't use the first floor that much unless I actually start living in the building, because it became like a little bit of security. Um, so we're going to go on, but you can see from your question, there's a million different reasons why people would want to live in this block. Yeah. But back then, it was not what it is today. I mean, it was crazy. For three years in a row, I had to sleep in a bathroom, yeah. you know? And I couldn't tell anybody that I lived in the building because I was this director of this big environmental organization. And the people, the way they looked at it, now it's different. Also, I'm a plumber, and I just want you to understand, it was, the situation has changed a lot. I ride my bike to a plumbing job. And at the same time, when I moved into the squat, I told you know, each time there's different politically correctness, and I could under, you have to understand that. Uh, it's, it's difficult, you know, that kind of thing. But So we're gonna move on. Um, so, how did people get into the buildings? This is a bulk cutter. It's pretty much the way all the community gardens were opened up and a lot of the spots were opened up. Also, there's a hammer, you can dash your way in. This really doesn't work that great anymore because they come out with this product called hardened steel. You probably see it in bike locks and stuff. So if you're gonna cut cut it, go with a friend. You know, here's how you do it, right? You wanna scope out the building you're interested in. You wanna find out the history of the building you're interested in. You wanna hopefully make sure it's owned by the city. You wanna talk to the people in the community and then when you have your right to go in, you kinda do something like this and you kinda break into the building. So it's kind of a little bit illegal, right? Then this state-of-the-art tool just came out with that lithium battery, which is so amazing. Um, so this is, uh, everybody knows what this is, right? No. Nope. Okay. This is uh, a grinder, which operates at a very high rate of speed. And it's a, a cordless grinder, which means it has no power. This battery here powers the grinder. Now, the way that you used to use a grinder in the past is you'd have to have an extension cord and run it all the way to like a street pole. And the street poles will also weigh that squatters got electricity, gardeners get electricity. In the bottom of a lot of street poles in New York City, they have these little, um, I was gonna bring that kit, but I didn't bring it in. It has a little thing, it's called a pigtail, and you can plug into it. So as the light comes to the street, at the bottom of this light right here, you can't see it, but I can. There's a little opening, and you use like just a fork, and you turn the two prongs, and it's most likely power. And that was how you got power to open up the building if you couldn't get in. But now this new one here is amazing. So what you want to do is get a metal blade, as thin as possible, get your buddy, you always want to have a buddy, maybe a walkie-talkie, maybe a cell phone, and then this spins so fast that it'll cut through anything. But you want to make sparks. You want to have someone hold up like a rod, or someone hold up a, a blanket to get in the building and stuff like that. Does that make uh, sense to people? This grinder? Cool. How many people have used the grinder? No. One, two. Cool. And you see how it cuts through anything, right? It's crazy. So this tool is unbelievable. Okay, so you get in the building and you want to like start like thinking about different systems. Like what, how can I get this building functioning? You have a team of people, there's probably no, nothing going on. A lot of times in New York City and other cities, uh, this is a waste system. And so the waste system goes by gravity. And the way it works, the trap. Oh, yeah, the sewer trap. Yeah, which stops the gas from coming up. There's a little water in there. So the water goes down, goes past the trap a little bit, backwards. But you see how it's going on an angle? That's called gravity, right? And it's all pitched. This pipe is pitched. It's in the street. It's all going down pitched. So it collects all the water from all the buildings and goes down pitch. You really need to get your sewage system working when you move into the building. Most of them do work. They just might be clogged or something like that. So what kind of pipe is this? This is actually clay pipe because you can see these fittings. They used to put them in. They pour lead fittings. It was like a crazy thing. Now they use cast iron. <clears throat> or the newest is these no hardwood clamps. Very under no pressure. The water just flows. So if I were to take this upside down, Water would just pour out, right? But if I put a hole in it, it's coming out already, it would pour out even faster. That's called venting. So air has to replace the water. So that's another thing we're going to talk about. Water going down, vents going up. This is a waste system. So this is what it looks like when you get into your building. You see something like this. 
That's the toilet, that's the sink, old school tub with the, the, the cord, really heavy tub. So now we see how it works. You see the air going up, vent, vent, vent. As the water goes down, the air goes up. As each unit gets picked up, the pipes get bigger. Inch and a half, two inch, inch and a half, two inch, two inch, four inch. Probably over here, six inch, 20 inch, five feet, whatever. So as, as more items get picked up on it, it expands. So the water goes into the sink, comes down. At the same time, a little bit of air goes up to the roof. If you get in there and it's clogged, you guys have all like tried to like unclog the toilet, right? So it's the same thing. You're gonna have to try to get this working. All these systems are usually in, coming in from the basement. So you wanna go to the street side of the basement. You wanna like test it maybe with a garden hose. And then if not, you get a clean out and you can just, that means you can open up into the system and try to get it going. Any questions about this? Any architects here? One of the architects. <laughs> so this is more like an architectural drawing. It'll show like how each thing is picked up, where it's going, what's going on with that. And then, you know, it all comes together and goes into that spot at the street. Um, water. Uh, the water in New York City is amazing. Let me see if we can see some water towers. Yeah, there's some water towers. You guys can't see them. <laughs> so, the water in New York City is amazing. It's like the lifeblood of the city. It's really great when you open up a building because you can just drink the water. It's, it's good, it's clean, it doesn't really need to be filled. This is the wall probably in the basement. We're on the first floor, mostly in the basement. And this is the street, let's say over here. Plumbing supply from the street. The water will come in. What kind of pipe will it be in? It will be maybe in lead. It's super old. They're getting rid of lead. It's crazy bad. That's the only thing wrong with the water. Or it will be in brass or copper. So the water will come in and it hits its first valve, the main valve it's called, right? So this valve, you turn it and it opens it up and you turn it and it closes. Then this is a pressure relief valve just because they don't want too much pressure. You don't have to worry about this. This is kind of a newer system. You just want to get the water on. So you don't need to know about this. But then there might be a water meter and that's what it looks like. If the water meter, the newer water meters have a, a wire going to it and people can read the water meter from the street. So there's technology that's coming into a lot of these things making it very difficult to squat because if they know you're in the building right away, you don't have that head start. So some of the new electrical meters actually send a signal up, like your cell phone, and they're called smart meters. Those are gonna be very dangerous. All the pot dealers are actually getting busted right now because they can see your electrical use and know what's going on. So along with these meters, you need to study them. There's a lot of new technology, but most of the buildings you're gonna be going into are super old. They're not gonna have that technology, but if you do happen to see wires going to anything, you pull them out, like especially the meters, because that's an electronic way that someone can tell you in the building. So water's coming in. How do you, you go upstairs, you see there's no water, which is normal. The building's abandoned, there's gonna be no water. So you wanna turn the water on, get your buddy, get some flashlights, and you wanna turn on this main valve but you wanna turn it on ever so slowly because it's a very dangerous, weird situation. You wanna treat this with a lot of respect and you don't want to just blast it on. It's not a good situation to do that. And then you wanna have someone kind of at the first fitting, like wherever it is, and that'll be a sink. So the other day, I think it was like a week ago, I got a call and we were trying to get into a building. And we turned on the water in the basement and there was a leak coming through the ceiling on the second floor. How'd that happen? It was a push, you didn't check everything. So this water goes up five stories. So you have to check it everywhere, right, for a leak. Uh, if there's a leak, you can kind of cut it off and then adapt it, run a garden hose to it. So you want to get water. And the way to do that is you start in the basement. Oh, yeah, so these are these cool water towers you see everywhere in New York City. Um, why, what, do you, what do you guys think, why do we see these water towers? Anybody know? Water pressure. Water pressure, yeah. Um, that have water towers are kind of over five stories. And the ones that don't need water towers are under five stories. And that's kind of really important because as a squatter, you're probably not gonna go into a building with electricity. So you probably wanna pick one without the water tower. Would anybody want, this is a kind of crazy and it's gonna be probably the most interesting thing you've learned today. Would anybody know why you wanna go into a building or under five stories? Well, I said that, but what's the difference? Municipal water towers are only five stories tall. So, uh, well, at least like outside of the city, I don't really know inside the city you know, how the water tower situation is. 
but the water can only flow as high as the like the water level within the nearest tower. So like that's how the pressure is regulated and stuff. So it's very close. Anybody want to pick up on that? The only water can only flow to a certain point. Why? It's like without electricity, I guess, right? Yeah. Would anybody else have a reason for that? It makes New York City unique. If it's a blackout, people would go crazy. They'd be swimming across New Jersey, but no one panics, right? Because they have water. Only the small only the smaller buildings have water. Does anybody know why? The electrical pumps will get shut off of the water. That's right. Why though? Why? What's the reason that these smaller buildings have water and the taller ones don't? Besides electricity, you know it's electricity. The gravity of the water comes from the city from the There's the answer. Exactly. So the Catskill Mountains that the water comes from, it's an amazing design, are coming under like around seven feet wall right here, and it comes in on this pipe. Kind of makes a turn right here, and this first yellow valve, hard to see, is called the ball valve, just on and off. This is a traditional uh, turn valve, and then it goes into the water meter, and then it goes up into the building, spreads into different people's apartments. The, it only comes in cold water, it never comes in hot water. So the cold water will then revert, the cold water that comes in will go to a hot water heater, then it will become hot water, but the same pressure that's coming in will take over in the hot water system and it'll be treated the same. How do you how do you get hot water? If you're a squat or a drag, how do you get hot water? But you do need electricity. So fire. What <laughs> fire, yeah. So some of the early squats, Casa de Sol in the Bronx, they had uh, they used to cook up their hot water uh, uh, bullet space, they had a way to make hot water as well. Um, I saw some early stuff where, where um, the shower heads would produce a little bit of hot water, we used to have those as well. But basically, you need to get a hot water here and, and provide electricity or you use gas. And that's how most people get hot water. But it's a little tough for squatters to get hot water. Most likely, you're not gonna get that right away because you do need electricity. Um, but you know there's other ways and you can use solar heating systems and, and drop the, the temperature a little. Or um, what a lot of people do is they'll just the water in the pipe becomes a little less cold and you take really quick showers and that kind of thing. Um, but most of the time people got their water from hydrants. Uh, so this is a big plus to have water. What is this pipe here, this green looking pipe? That is the ground for the building. You've got to be careful if you see something like that. You always want to make sure there's a ground. The ground goes to the water line, that, that's a safe connection. Here's another ground here. So when you see these grounds, you don't want to mess with them because they help like, people not get electrocuted. But basically, these two valves here are like really, really important. You're the first valves coming into the building. If you mess those up, you're in a bad situation. You have to clock your street, and you only have this much room to work. You know, So if you screw this area up, it's best that you leave these valves on and then work with valves over here. So when you hear about all these nuclear power accidents, it's always the valve. Like, the valve can fail, it's, it's got water inside it, you can't really see what it's doing. So you think the valve's on, but it's off. So these valves are very delicate, and you want to really give them a lot of respect. So I would think that this was the original valve, and then they put another valve after it. That's a good thing, because you don't want to use the original valve. Just keep it open after a while. There are valves coming in uh, with the New York City, and, and they haven't turned them off the city because they're terrified. So there are <coughs> valves on the ground that, that people aren't messing with. They just keep them in the open position because they can really present a problem. So any more questions about this? Every building, there's a water shut off at the street. So in New York City, everything's on the ground. So let's just say this is my door. I'm coming out of my building. Here's the sidewalk. Pretty much right before the street, there'll be a little thing like this, and there'll be another one. You probably see them in the little square things that says gas. This gas is water. There's no electricity though, and I'll explain that in a minute. You have to go somewhere else. So you open up this. This is a little more technical now. Then you need a long wrench. This thing is like five feet long, and it has a, a T handle. Oh my god, it's so washed out. <laughs> it. Let's see, it looks fine over there. So it goes up here, it's got a T-handle and this little thing, and you put it down the hole, and then you just give it a half a turn, and that'll turn on water to the building. Um, can you see it on this one? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's a little bit hard to get this tool. You know, you gotta like have money. <laughs> you gotta have friends in the right places. So here's both the systems working together. So we have our waste system, which is in the black, and we have our water system, which is kind of slightly above it. So we talked about the water being under pressure, right? Coming down from the mountains, going in there, getting in your hot water heater. This is your faucet. We all turn that on almost every day. That water's under pressure. The minute that water gets past the bottom edge of your sink, it's just falling. So it goes from water under pressure to gravity. The gravity system is super easy to fix. You guys can do this with duct tape. Just make sure it's clear. You can do that. The water system is much more difficult. So if you have a leak in a pipe, it's really hard. I would, I really would recommend you get someone else to help you. Uh, there, anybody seen this thing? You solder the pipes together. So it's a copper pipe. You'd have to cut it open, fix the leak, cut open both sides, solder it, and then you have to use a torch, you heat it up, and then it melts around the pipe. If there's any water in there at all, it won't work. It'll frustrate you the first time. So a good thing to do in the beginning, you know, you really want to get your toilet working. So here's your toilet. The way a toilet works is the water will come in, there's a valve here, and it will fill up. You guys heard it fills up after you flush it. It's like a little buoy in there, and then it shuts off. So you can actually get a bucket and use the toilet. And it's called a bucket flush. So you just pour the bucket down here, like that, and it flushes everything down. And then it's just the same thing as this. Just This is actually doing a bucket flush. You turn the handle, this whole thing comes in here and goes down. So you can duplicate that just by a bucket. So you can use a garden hose, fill up your bucket, the bucket's near there. You know, everybody, all the squatters, they had piss buckets, they had water buckets. It was just buckets for everything, right? So you need water, and then you can do bucket flushing. But eventually you want to get your water working, and you can use like a garden hose. It's much cheaper, and you can try to tie into different systems. Like if there's a leak, you just go past that system, and then there's these new couplings, I think they're called snake bike couplings. Then you get a snake bike to a garden hose end, and then you do that on both sides, and you just run garden hoses because you don't really want to spend too much money. This is copper pipe, it's super expensive. So you just want to get the system working. If you get into the squat and you're able to stay there a couple of years, then you might want to think about upgrading the system. Um, so cold and hot water, it comes in at the basement, like one inch, starts going up three quarter, and then it starts supplying everything in the bathroom at half inch. Now it's kind of opposite, right, of the waste. The waste starts off small and gets bigger. The water does the opposite thing because the water is using pressure and the size of the pipe. So the water will start off big and get small and then kind of a little bit opposite. I mean, yeah, maybe the same actually, right? Because the waste will get bigger. It's just a little bit of an opposite direction. Any questions about this whole system? The gas valve is much different than the plumbing valve. You turn them, this is just either one way straight with the pipe is on, crooked with the pipe is off, it's just a one thing like this, comes in, you really don't want to mess with gas. If you go into a building and you smell gas, you want to go back outside the building and come in again, come in again, because you're only going to smell that gas when you come in. And you want to get really used to not being around gas, because once you're used to it, you'll get used, I mean, you want to get used to trying to not be around gas if you think it smells because it's very dangerous and, and it could be actually, after a while, you just don't smell the gas. The gas comes, you know, I don't know, probably it's probably more engineer people how we get gas. Is that like gas comes from the top of oil or something? Um, it's, it depends. Um, I'm chemical engineering, major, <laughs> so I should know about this. But I'm more like the food side than the petroleum side. But um, I'm a freshman, so never mind. But, uh, and my gas comes either from like gas only uh, wells where they drill into uh, so light a match. Light a match, that's more dangerous for you. Yeah, it's more hassle. Yeah. You could, um, like, I haven't actually heard of this being done, but I think in theory you could like. Dish washing detergent, and you put it in a spray bottle with water, and you shake it up, and if you think you smell gas, you'll spray it in here, you'll spray it in there, and you just look for it bubbling. And then that's how you find the leak. So the first thing you want to do 
because you want to open the window. Then why, right? You want to tell people why? So there could be a crazy gas leak over here, but if the window's open, it's no problem, right? If the window's not open and somebody hits the light switch, eventually. They're about to blow up. Right. And I got what happened um, a lot of things sometimes with um, oh, these gas pipes. What is the gas pipe? We talked about the waste pipe was just to go through the piping now. The waste pipe was clay, the old ones, cast iron, and now they're called this material called, it's kind of cast iron mix called NOAA. The water pipes were um, old school water pipes or lead, which is horrible, but mostly they're brass and copper. Gas pipes are just steel, pretty much, hardened steel. And you gotta make sure there's a few different types of steel. If you wanna repair this, you have to use the right materials. There's threads here, so they're screwed together. Right, old school system, you screw it together. The water system is sweated, so it just goes in. The cast iron are just like put together with clamps. So there's all different ways to put the pipe together as well. So you really don't want to mess with gas, right? I mean, you guys just moving into a building, you just want to make sure it's off. Like, you know, I mean, unless you, you, this is like a year down the road from when you open up the building. You do not want to try to get all the buildings lit up with gas. Because this goes into a branch system, which then goes to each apartment. And it's so much piping. Like one little leak, it's, it's not worth it. Because any kind of leak with gas, the, the, the city will go crazy. And it will shut you down immediately. You tell them, like, look, we're living in a building, the gas is off, they think differently about it because a fire is your worst enemy as a squatter. And that's your worst nightmare yeah. as well. So, um, because like, we've been in a conversation with, um, like, what can I hear? You see these all the time. These would be individual apartments. This might be your apartment, this might be the one next door, and the, the gas will come in from that main, and then they'll have shutoffs. See, there's a shutoff here. And you can see that shot up there, there's a little hole in it so you can lock it. So you're probably going to see it lock, and you'll have to cut that off. And you can use that grinder tool I was talking about to cut off the locks. Sometimes the pipes are locked. There's also a way that's called tapping, or um, in electrical terms, uh, might be slightly different. And you want to override the meters. So when you get in there, especially with electricity, you're going to go in before the meters. And, and, and you tap in and you get free electricity. So not only are we taking over the building for free, but we're taking over all the sources of energy for free. So that's the way you do it in the beginning. But you know, in a lot of the buildings, people want to just get right to the pay their electrical bill, and they could do that, and it gives them more standing in court. But then you're paying a bill. Um, there used to be phone bills before cell phone bills, <laughs> which don't exist, so there's no phone bill anymore. But there, most of the time, people did when they moved into the building. When I, not anymore, where I'm paying my electrical bill, which kind of sucks, but there was a time where I just had like free power and electric, you know what I mean? So I had the choice of both powers, which I thought was really great. There are other buildings that I know they had what's called blackout, where they had special curtains that would black out the window because they were stealing electricity and they didn't want anybody to see them. So they had blackout, you know, quotas and stuff. But not that people even know, like, who's paying, who's not paying. Sometimes the Con Edison doesn't really care about squatting as much as the city, you know, and sometimes if your squat isn't political, the city doesn't care either. So it's a lot about politics as well. So and bureaucrats. Yeah, I mean, it's like a whole bunch of things. Okay, electricity, this is the thing you're probably not gonna have in the beginning, but then later on you might have it. This is a little bit newer. I actually took this picture in the C-Squat. So the electricity will come in again from this street. It goes into this box that you can't see. It's right below this box. And that would be the box to jump into. You can just go there with some people and you can just turn it on. Just on and off. Inside here it fuses. If it doesn't go on, you turn it back off. You open up this panel and you'll see three different fuses. And then you try to figure out like how it works. And then this electrical here will go to the meters. And then the meters subdivide it to these other panels. These things are breaker fuses. So if you box. Yeah, so you, you, you can label it and try to figure out which apartment. Some apartments are going to be bad, some are going to be good. You turn them off. It could have old school fuses, the round ones. This is more of a newer system, but you see there's a meter here. So eventually you want to jump the meters and go directly into this system. So you go around the meter thing 
that way you don't really have to pay for it. Um, so there's a lot of ways around to do that. You probably should get some electrical help with that. A national squatter symbol, it's used all over the world. Um, if you go by a building and you see it, most likely it's a squat. And pretty much that's, uh, and you know a lot of the squats in New York City, I noticed they have glass bottles. So if you see like glass bottles connected in the building somewhere, like just the end of the bottle, this end sticking out at you or something like colorful, that's most likely a squat too. You can use a lot of recycled stuff and it's just a good telltale sign. Um, that's pretty much it. I guess the other guys didn't stick around, um, come, but I'll stick around and answer any questions for about a couple of minutes.